Let us pray. God of long winters and here in this space, short summers, in the words of Paul, do your best to come to us quickly. Come to us with loud praise and joy. Or appear to us in a still, small voice. Come to us through friends or come to us through strangers. Come to us in this text and in this hour of worship. And come to us quickly if you can. We are seeking you. We are always seeking you. With grateful hearts cracked open by love, we pray. Amen. So I've been meaning to ask, what do you need? What does each of us need individually? What does the church need as an institution? What do its leaders need to make our mission and ministry sustainable for as long as possible? We have two texts that we are offered this morning from this worship series, one from Job and one from 2 Timothy. In Job, his friends respond to his trauma by being present with him. They witness the weight of the trauma. from the commentary on this passage in this worship series by Reverend Remington Johnson. How can we show up for one another in ways that both explicitly show that we see the pain of the moment and also that we are not afraid to sit with someone in pain? This being with one another is incarnational. The word made flesh. It is a sacred act. Every Sunday we come together to do this. We witness each other's existence, traumas, needs, and spend time together. Sacred space, and sacred time. That is one of the majority of our, one of our responsibilities as Christians, as members of a faith community, to be with one another, to listen to one another, to come into conversation without judgment, not necessarily even advice. The giggles from the organ about the, uh, <clears throat> yeah. We come together as sacred community. And then there's the second letter to Timothy from Paul. Reverend Johnson continues, Paul offers us a moment of intense humility as he opens himself up to share what he needs. The grievances, the stuff, all of it is important, and offering space for folks to respond openly and honestly about what they need is such a sacred act. 
We can respond to someone's named needs with additions and clarifications, helping them really target the need that caused the specific request to arise. But again, the first step is hearing, fully hearing what someone need, someone's needs are and discovering how we might respond. The question, what do you need, decenters the one offering aid, so the one hurting has autonomy. However, we must also be willing to pose the question to all people in a relationship in and community. Caregivers and caretakers have needs that shouldn't be ignored or dismissed. Notice that I often include caretakers, caregivers, etc. in my pastoral prayer for just that reason. How can this question be used for further interdependence, reciprocity, and the sharing of power in our relationships? So two questions. I ask them to the kids, too. What do you need from the church? What does the church need from you? As I sat with the text and as I sat with the themes, there are two ways to go. There is a lot of hurt and grief and sorrow and illness and anxiety in the world. We need each other. We need each other as church for those pieces of care. We need people to listen and sit with us. We need somebody to listen when we are crying out in need. And here's a piece of personal humility, I guess. I have not been so great about your needs, your emotional prayer needs, your needs of family and hurt and congregational care. Because I've been sidelined by the needs of the institutional of the church. Because the church needs more people to step up and volunteer. I love church. I am mired in church. I love my little white church in Durham where I grew up. I love the city church in Boston where I was ordained. I love the suburban churches where I've served. I love this church where I was called that when I was in Boston a couple of weeks ago, I said, remember, I'm at that church. That profile was written for me. Remember? And I'm tired. So what the church needs from you and what I need from you is to participate in these coming conversations about the ways that we do governance in this church. The ways that we do and be church. Because folks, you are wonderful. I had a lovely conversation with an individual you'll probably hear be, 
be hearing more from Doug Bixby, who helps with church governance. I talked to him Friday afternoon, and he said, this sounds like a great place. I'd love to be in conversation with them. I said, I know, right? I know, right? These are kind people who put up with my shenanigans. I don't know where that was on, on the profile, but you put up with my shenanigans. Bless you. These are kind people who take the heart of mission and ministry personally, internally. You live out the church in the world. This church has done great things and will continue to do great things. But what the church needs also from you is to invest in the conversation going forward of what this looks like in our new chapter. As I've talked with colleagues across the country, we are not alone. And we're not, it's not even about churches either. It's, Lisa Laughlin would probably agree to this too, that it's true of nonprofits as well. That our years of COVID and pandemic have exacerbated trends that were already there. One of the things that I really enjoy about that text from Paul is saying, you know what? We can make this happen. Just have to rearrange things a little bit. I have faith. I have hope. This is a, this, you disciples are people, you people in the world can do great things. This power of the risen Christ in us is capable of amazing things. I think I'm just going to leave it there. So I've been meaning to ask, ask beloved ones, what do you need from the church? And what does the church need from you? So this affirmation that's printed in the bulletin is part of, actually all the liturgy is part of this sermon series, this worship series. So I invite you to join me. We believe in relationships. We believe in asking hard questions, in showing up for one another, and in sitting together through the pain. We believe in listening with grace, learning with curiosity, and apologizing with sincerity. We believe in asking for help, saying what we need, and trusting that no degree of vulnerability could strip us of God's love. We believe in trying our best and offering grace when our best is not enough. And we believe that God is in all relationships, modeling for us the value of community through the relationships of the Trinity. So we love today, and we strive to love even more tomorrow. Let it be so.